Okay, class, good day. So this is now the second part of the slides on drying and it concerns already the classification and the selection of dryers. Now, this uh, particular part of the slide is based solely on Colson, on the volume concerning the unit operation drying. Now, according to Crawl, we can classify dryers ba based on this eight ways of classifying them so the first one here is based on the operating temperature and pressure in the dryer and the second one is based on heating so whether it's conductive drying convective drying or radiative drying or a combination of the three now it could also be based on the manner in which the moist material that is the feed is transported through the dryer and based on any mechanical aids that are uh, designed together with the equipment to improve the drying process so our dryer can be based or classified based on that then we can also have it classified referring to the dryer based on the way air is circulated inside the equipment then on how the feed if it is moist is being supported uh, when it is fed to the dryer is also a way of classifying a dryer then the heating medium but most of the time actually class the heating medium that is being used is just air and the last way of classifying dryers is based on the nature of the wet feed and how it is being introduced into the dryer so these are the eight ways ways rather in which crawl classified dryers as read from the volume by Coulson on drying the second to the easiest way of classifying dryers based on the heat transfer which has also mentioned by crawl so you can classify dryers based on the mode of heat transfer which is conductive convective or radiative or a combination of these three then we can also classify dryers uh, based on the operation so this is the simply yes because you can simply say whether a dryer is operated batch or whether it's operated by a continuous process so when the material is insert, inserted into the drying equipment and the drying proceeds for a given amount of time then that's batch drying now if the material however is continuously dried or continuously added into the dryer and then it's continuously removed after it has undergone drying then it's a process which we call continuous drying now this is also found in Colson and in here the classification of dryers is already based on the type of operation whether it's batch or continuous based on the heat transfer that was capitalized on in accomplishing the drying process and based on the type of equip of feed rather that is to be used. So in here for a batch dryer which can be using or which can be using conductive heat transfer convective heat transfer or other ways of heat transfer in this case in the last here you could read that it's using uh, freeze or radio frequency and you can have microwave or solar type of drying so these are the other ways of drying the material as suggested by Coulson if the material is solid or particulate in nature and if the drying process is by batch so this is how it is to be interpreted if your material is liquid or is a pumpable liquid and you want to use conductive heat transfer then the filter type of dryer is suggested now in the next slide you will have the continuous dryers of course still uh, divided into three groupings here using conductive drying convective drying and other types of drying ir here is even mentioned infrared and you have here uh, also the type of feed that was mentioned in batch dryers there is an added type of feed here for continuous dryers which is the sheet or film type of feed so in this case you have these suggested dryers inside the box for a continuous dryer using a specific type of heat transfer okay that's how Coulson categorize it but in terms of how uh, heat is being introduced into the dryer to accomplish the drying or generally how is drying accomplished then you have these three categorization the first part is heating by direct contact with heated air 
and where the water vapor from the dried material is now withdrawn as water vapor and goes with and is removed by air and goes with the air as the air leaves the dryer so this is usually the case this is usually the mechanics inside the dryer warm air is introduced warm air carries the water from the feed in the form of water vapor and it leaves the dryer together with the air this is the usual case in the case of vacuum dryer you have the removal of water which proceeds rapidly than the first one and it's under low pressure as such it's called vacuum dryer so heat here is indirect so the heating process is indirect and it could be accomplished by contact with the metal wall or by radiation the other type is freeze drying this is in the case of frozen feed in which uh, the water vapor that is in it or rather not water vapor but that the water that is on it being solid in form because it's frozen does not pass through the liquid state but rather is sublimed directly into the gas phase meaning it's converted directly into water vapor and that's in the case of freeze drying so these three actually generally generally can be used as a manner of categorizing the process of drying it's the process that we are categorizing it's not based on the equipment it's not based on the feed but rather it's general the process itself so the first one is direct heating the second one is indirect vacuum drying and the third one is freeze drying now the first type of dryer that i'm going to show to you is the batch type the tray or shelf dryer which is most of the time being used in the food industry so we place the the processed feed inside the cabinets we call them cabinets place inside trays let them stay in the equipment for some time and then we draw them based on the setting of the moisture that we want our product to have once it leaves the dryer already now i have here a video that will show how a tray dryer or shelf dryer operates So what you just show, uh, show what was just shown is vacuum drying in direct heating because it's using uh, hot steam or water rather heated water to uh, warm the uh, object inside the trays in our tray dryer or shelf dryer that is so it's vacuum because the operation is under 180 m pressure it's below 180 m pressure so let's proceed so that's for the tray or shelf dryers so these tray or shelf dryers are commonly <coughs> excuse me used for granular materials and for individual particles so the material is placed on a series of trays which may be heated from below by steam coils and drying is carried out by the circulation of air over the material now in some cases the air is heated and then passed once through the oven although in the majority of this type of dryer some recirculation of air takes place and the air is reheated before it is passed over each of the shelves that contains the material to be dried as air is passed over the wet material both its temperature referring to the air and its humidity is expected to change now in here racks are mounted on track wheels it was shown to you in the illustration so that they can be pulled out of the uh, chamber they're useful when the production rate is small and can dry almost anything 
but its labor requirement for loading and unloading is expensive. You need somebody to load the material and unload it after uh, the set time for drying. Now, drying by circulation of air is slow and drying cycles can take as much as 3 hours to 48 hours per batch. And as such, this is not suited for uh, large-scale drying. So, may be operated under vacuum as, as, sh as sh uh, shown to you in the video and often with indirect heating. It was also shown to you under vacuum and indirect heating. Now, we have this fourth sample problem concerning drying. So, in here, you're given a 100 kilogram batch of granular solids containing 30% moisture and it is to be dried in a tray dryer to 15.5% of moisture by passing a current of air at 350 Kelvin tangentially across its surface at the given velocity of 1.8 meters per second. Now, if the constant rate of drying under this condition is 0 0.0007 kilograms per second per meter squared and the critical moisture content is 15%, Calculate the approximate drying time, assuming that the drying surface to be a 0 0.03 square meter per kilogram dry mass. So now let's go to our Google jump board for this so that I can show to you the uh, process of the solving the particular requirement of determining the drying time for the specific dryer that was shown to you, which is the tray dryer. Okay, so this is now our board and this is where I'm going to write the given for this particular problem. So this is actually, uh, sorry class, this is actually our fourth sample problem. So I have finished already giving you the three. So for this problem, we will just show our dryer as a block. And we'll have here the air. And for that air that was stated in the problem, it is introduced into the dryer at this rate, 1.8 meters per second. And it's at a temperature of 350 Kelvin. Now, your air is to leave the dryer, not uh, given the, any condition for that matter, but for the feed that is to be processed by your dryer. You have it as at 100 kilograms. And it has a percentage of water which is 30%. So, quite... This is quite a moist feed because 30 kilograms of the 100 is water. Your feed, of course, is to leave the dryer with this amount of moisture left. So, 15.5 or that's 15.5% water from the original, which is 30% water. So, this is your dried feed, but not bone dry because it still has moisture so when we speak of bone dry in drying zero that means zero moisture so the rate of drying in this case it was mentioned in the problem that i've read is 0 0.000 so three zeros and a seven kilogram per second per meter squared and the critical moisture content is 15%. Then you have the area to be 0 0.03 square meter. This is per K. 
kilogram of solid so this is, this refers to the amount of surface exposed for drying per kilo of solid that is introduced into your dryer so in this dryer we expect that a certain amount of water vapor so let's see certain amount of vapor so we'll have it as v that will be withdrawn and that particular vapor is to go with the air so it will not actually leave your dryer as v but rather it will leave the dryer together with this air the reason why i'm writing it here so that when you balance later on you are you are to separately think of this as if it's a separate entity but actually it's with the air that leaves your dryer so this is your required uh, required information so you are required for the drying time so you are required for the drying time and we'll go to the next slide for the solution to this So in this particular problem, when we speak of the drying time, of course, it has to be associated with something. So when you think, where will I get the drying time based on the things that were provided for me in the problem? If you look at the given information, you have percentages of water in the feed and in the dry feed, dried feed that is, then the critical moisture content, the area per kilogram of solid, and the air that is being used. You could see that based on the values or the quantities that I have mentioned, none has the time element except the air, which has the time element in the speed. So this is the speed in which air is being introduced into the dryer. But when we speak of the drying time, it has something to do with this one, the rate in which drying has to occur. So in this case, we have to be very specific that this rate is per kilogram. That's per kilogram of water. 0 0.0007 kilogram of water is being taken away from your feet that is to be dried per second per square meter of area exposed. So for us to be able to, if this would be our shall I say the quantity that will point us to the drying time then we need to know the amount of water that was vaporized because this is the amount of water here and we need to know the exposed area for such an a feed that was processed by your dryer so we will go uh, one uh, step at a time in this case but you know for now that for you to be able to know the drying time you will need to use the rate of drying or that would be the r sub c now for you to find the time this should be your divisor so i'm now actually using dimensional analysis this should be your divisor that way the time unit in the denominator of your rate for drying will be the time that will come out as the unit of time for the drying time for you to eliminate the other two that was what i mentioned a while ago you need to know the water vaporized and you need to know the exposed surface that way the remaining unit here when you deal with this particular quantity later on is simply the time unit so let's go about doing that so we will account for the mass of h2o in the feed so i partly mentioned it already when i write the given when i wrote the given so that's 100 kilograms times 0.30 so that would give it 30 kilos this is the amount of water sorry it's so hard to write now 30 kilograms of water in the feed then the mass of water in the dried feed should be of course equal to uh, or should be based on the percentage of the water that is given in that particular dried feed but what we know but what we know class is this that you have 15.5% of water in your dried feed so we will have that you do not know that water in the dried feed the remaining water so we'll place it as x because you do not know that water 
and that water that is x present in your dried feed should be added to the dry amount of material meaning if all water is taken out from your feed that would mean that your dry material will be the 100 the original minus the water that it contains because this dry part of your feed will be fixed it is not dependent on the process it's fixed already so now you have the water over the water plus the dried feed which will give you the percentage of water in the dried material in this case now this question mark that i have here i will change to x and this x so this is the water vaporized is 12.8 kilograms so this is the amount of water that was uh, shall I say not vaporized but rather the amount of water remaining remaining in your dried material so if you want to know the mass H2O vaporized or in terms of what I've labeled in our illustration in the previous slide that would be the V this one that's the V then that would be of course you know how to balance you will simply have to subtract this one remaining in the dried feed from the original which is 30 so the original water is 30 and we will subtract the remaining water then the vaporized water will be of course so I'll subtract 12.8 so that the vaporized water in this case is 17.2 kilograms so now that take care that take care of this kilogram here because this is water evaporated per second per square meter so the next problem the next thing that we need to determine is the exposed surface area that way we can get rid of this the total surface area exposed and remember that based on the given in the problem the area is 0 0.03 square meter per kilogram of dry solid per kilogram of solid so what we'll do next slide here we will determine the excuse me the area of the dried solid so area of dry solid or solids that's this will be equal to so you have 0 0.03 meter squared per kilogram excuse me dry solid and you need to multiply this with the kilogram of dry solid which we know to be 70 100 minus 30 is 70 so kilogram dry solid so you have now an area which is equal to 2.1 square meter so knowing the area and knowing the amount of water that is to be vaporized so the time for drying i'd like to use another slide in this case the time for drying will be so i need to get rid of the kilogram on top so that would be my amount of water vaporized so 17.2 go here so 17.2 V this is your V or this is I like to place a parenthesis kilogram water I will divide by uh, the rate which is 0 0.0007 kilogram water per sorry per second per meter squared so i will cancel now the kilogram of water the only way that time will the only be unit left in this uh, calculation will be a uh, multiply my denominator with the area exposed and i have 
and we have solved that already in this slide so that would be your 2.1 square meter so I will have here 2.1 square meter so this cancels the square meter leaving us a unit for the drying time so your drying time is 11,000 700 seconds or this is or this is like 3.25 hours so true to the range of time in which a particular batch for drying should occur in the case of the tray dryer it's like 3 to 48 hours so actually we're on the lower range of that particular uh, value for the drying time for a tray dryer so for our problem this is the answer the drying time based on the rate of drying so we did solve it using uh, the case of dimensional analysis we didn't use any uh, formula but we use only dimensional analysis coupled with the ordinary very ordinary material balance accounting for the amount of water that was vaporized so we will continue now with our slides and that's our sample problem number four now we will continue so now we have the tunnel dryer so I think it's already implied in the type of dryer what's happening here so you have a tunnel in which your material is to pass through at the end of the tunnel that material is expected to have a decreased amount of moisture content now in tunnel dryers you have a series of trays or trolleys that are moved slowly through a long tunnel which or may not be heated and drying takes place in the current of warm air so it could be something like ambient heating only now tunnel dryers are used for drying paraffin wax gelatin soap even pottery wear and wherever the throughput is so large that individual cabinet dryers would involve too much handling or labor cost that is so this is in the case of very large throughput meaning the amount that is expected to be processed for a certain amount of time is big or this is the rate of product the dried product withdrawal that is we mean by that throughput alternatively the material is placed on a belt conveyor passing through a tunnel an arrangement which is well suited to vacuum operation meaning operation under or below one atmospheric pressure now we go to the drum dryer so as you can see mentioning it's a drum dryer then we expect that there has to be a drum and this is our cylindrical drum now in the case of drum dryers uh, you have one or more heated metal rolls on outside of which a thin layer of liquid is evaporated to dryness now this metal rolls class you have to understand to understand is being dipped on a particular basin or a particular uh, shall i say uh, support bottom in which the feed is being sucked out of that particular bottom part it attaches itself or it attaches itself on the drum wall and in the process of attaching itself on the drum wall a portion of its moisture content is being eliminated as in the case here in which a thin layer of liquid is evaporated to dryness now dried solid in this case the one that is attached on the drum already or the one that clinged on the drum already is scraped off the rolls as they slowly revolve now you could see this if you're going to do your OGT in sugar centrals the very simple example of a drum dryer is your filter cake drum wherein the filter cake is being sucked out of a particular uh, shall I say bottom part of the equipment and as the drum rolls the liquid on that particular clinging filter cake on the drum is being uh, the moisture content of that particular filter cake is being reduced so this is effective for dilute solutions concentrated solutions of highly soluble material and moderately heavy slurry in the case of the sugar central our drum uh, 
uh, cake drum dryer is actually processing heavy slurry slurry or that's already the very dirty thing that settles at the bottom of our clarifiers it's being processed further to take out the sugar that it may contain actually to take out the juice that might have still the sugar on it now this is not suitable for solutions of salts with limited solubility or for slurries of abrasive solids that settle out and create excessive pressure between the drums so it could not be used for abrasive solids now this is the one that i have mentioned so you have here a liquid or a slurry feed and that particular and then particular part of your drum is like touching the slurry and the slurry attaches itself here on the surface of the drum it clings on the drum in the process moisture is removed and the dried cake or solid that remains here is being scraped off and this is the what we call the filter cake in the case of sugar centron now the one that i'm going to show to you here is a drum dryer that is used in the food industry especially in producing the powdered milk so there are two slides if i'm not mistaken here or two videos one of which is is producing a a film or solid that is per, uh, further processed to produce the powdered milk and what you could see is actually a very thin film or sheet that is removed in the drum so please watch
So what you saw actually is a drum dryer uh, processing nachos. So the nachos came from those uh, cylindrical uh, rolls in which after which they are formed into sheets and they, they are being cut into uh, nachos already. Now I think this is the one which I'm referring to in which that produces milk, powdered milk that is. Okay, so do you see a film, but from the particular film, the powdered milk that is being placed on cans and foils are the ones that reaches us already. So those are manners in which the moisture of those particular material, food materials actually, or food that we are eating uh, is being reduced, that is using the drum dryer. Now we can also have the spray, the spray dryer. So our feed here is being uh, like introduced into our drying equipment in the form of air. So the process of drying can be co-current, counter-current, or mixed flow. In co-current, the fluid that is atomized or the fluid that is to be reduced in terms of its moisture content is atomized together with the air. As it, be, at it, as it is being introduced into your dryer. So you have the automizer in all set up. In here you have uh, co-current, meaning they enter the dryer in one direction. You have here counter current, so your feed is introduced here, but the air is introduced at the bottom. So they flow counter current to each other. Or it could be a, a combination of the co-current and the counter current scheme in which you have the mixed flow already. This is in the case of the spray dryer, okay? Now, this one is a spray dryer. Uh, I got this also from YouTube. This is how it dries up the, uh, not really dries up, but it reduces the moisture content of the feed that is being introduced to it or that is being processed through it.
So what you just saw is just a video of a sample of a co-current or a concurrent type of spray dryer. So the material that is to be dried is automized and it's introduced at the top of the uh, equipment together with the air that is being used to dry it up. So that's an example or it was an example of a spray dryer. Now, a spray dryer may combine the functions and of an evaporator, a crystallizer, and a dryer, and even a size reduction unit and a classifier. So, a slurry or liquid solution is dispersed into a stream of hot gas in the form of mist of fine droplets, and as such, the automizer. So, moisture is rapidly vaporized from the droplets, leaving residual particles of dry solid which are then separated from the gas stream now the spray dryer has very short drying time which permits drying of highly heat sensitive materials and the production of solid or hollow spherical particles so take note of its application so for heat sensitive materials and for the production of hollow spherical particles now the spray dryer yields product that is ready for package from a solution of slurry or thin paste not highly efficient though since much heat is lost in the discharge gases now bulky and very large and are not always easy to operate as you can see in the equipment uh, it's large it requires a big space it's bulky and it's not as easy to operate as the other type of dryers so far that I have mentioned. Now bulk density of the dry solid is difficult in this case to keep constant because as you can see the product that is being, with, uh, that is being produced is porous in, nature, porous in nature. So that in itself will make it very difficult to have a constant bulk density for the entire batch of solid that was processed by the given equipment now final dry particles here are often hollow and the product from a spray dryer is quite porous so mentioned already in the previous slide now the next dryer is the rotary dryer they it's actually commonly confused with the drum dryer they look similar but as to the objective or how it functions it's very different so take note of how a rotary dryer functions and what's its difference with the drum dryer so this consists of a revolving cylindrical shell horizontal or slightly inclined toward the outlet now the wet feed enters one end of the cylinder and the dry material discharges from the dryer this is opposite with that of the totally rather totally different from the drum dryer because in the drum dryer your feed is introduced on the surface of the drum and it clings on the drum and in the process its moisture content is being withdrawn in this case class though you have a cylindrical, cylindrical drum also but your feed is introduced in at one end and is this charged by gravity to the other end if your rotary dryer is inclined so it's going to be your product is going to be withdrawn by the process of uh, gravity now heat by direct contact of gas with the solid is being used in here and this one is desirable for materials that tend to dust so for materials that will tend to dust especially cement so it's the rotary dryer that is being used so the rotary dryer is not used to dry cement but rather more add rather the drum dryer the drum dryer is most of the time used in the food industry now this dryer is used for salt sugar and all kinds of granular so take note granular and crystalline materials that must be kept clean and may not be directly exposed to a very hot flu gas or to very hot flu gases so they, uh, actually it's also applicable for heat sensitive material due to the fact that there is no direct heating in the case of the rotary dryer but the main distinguishing part for the rotary dryer and the drum dryer is in the manner in which the feed is being handled in your dryer and as to the limitation of the rotary dryer wherein it cannot process those that tend to form dust this one is not mentioned in the drum dryer now your rotary dryer is applicable for continuous drying of materials on a large scale 0.3 kilogram per second so that would be like one ton per hour or greater 
a rotary dryer which consists of a relatively long cylindrical shell mounted on rollers and driven at low speed of up to 0.4 Hz is suitable. The shell is supported at small angle to the horizontal so that the material fed in at the higher end will travel through the dryer under gravity mentioned already and hot gases or air used as the drying medium are fed in either at the upper end of the dryer to give co-current flow or at the discharge end of the machine to give counter current flow. So take note that for rotary dryer we have a thing of counter current and co-current flow of the feed with the heating medium. In the case of the drum dryer there is no such thing as co-current and counter current because your feed is fed as a slurry at the bottom part of your drum and it's being sucked by the drum the solid clings to the drum and the moisture being reduced that is in the case of the rotary dryer so you should be able to distinguish the two now what are the heating methods for rotary dryer so we have direct heating where hot flue gases or air pass through the material in the dryer or we have indirect heating where the material is in an inner shell heated ex externally by hot gases now alternatively steam may be fed to a series of tubes inside the shell of the dryer so within the shell of your dryer you can also have these tubes uh, where steam is flowing that will heat up your uh, feed that is in that is being processed in your rotary dryer so this is a rotary dryer and this is the insides of a rotary dryer an example of the inside of a rotary dryer and i think a video will now be able to distinguish or discriminate the drum dryer which you have shown in two videos from the rotary dryer that will be shown to you in here Okay, so that is in the case of our rotary dryer. This one is another example of a rotary dryer. <coughs>
So it's convective drying. Uh, it's convective drying that was shown to you in the last video for the rotary drum dryer. So it's very easy to discriminate the drum dryer from the rotary dryer. Now in terms of the design consideration for the rotary dryer, so in terms of the heat transfer rate, so it's given by the formula UAV delta T where your Q is your rate of heat transfer, your U is the overall heat transfer coefficient. The V is the volume of the dryer, the A, the area of the contact, rather area of contact between the particles and the gas per unit volume of the dryer. So it's small a because it's area in contact between the particles and the gas per unit volume of the dryer or the drying equipment that is. The delta T is the mean temperature difference between the gas and the material. So this is how we determine the heat transfer rate for our rotary dryer. Now as for the length of the dryer, because as you can see it's a, in the form of a cylindrical shell and at times there are already manufacturers that have a particular size of tube for this particular dryer in which all you have to do in terms of the amount of material that you need to process and that is it has something to do with the heat transfer rate that you want it to accomplish and the mean temperature difference you will know how long a dryer you would be needing to accomplish that particular separation now the g prime in the formula that you are seeing here is the air mass velocity air being used as the heating medium the delta T look mean temperature difference between the material and the air. This one, the delta T LM. And the D, the diameter of the dryer in this case. So you could see that in here, you have already the formula that will allow you to solve for the length of a particular dryer. Now for adiabatic dryers, the normal number of transfer units, and this is the usual case in the industry, is solved using this particular formula. The T sub W is the wet bulb temperature, and you have TA1 and TA2 as the air temperatures in the, uh, in the inlet and exit, respectively, of your dryer. So the inlet air temperature and the outlet air temperature. Most of the time, this number of transfer units class, take note, if this is not mentioned in the problem, this is equal to 1.5. This will allow you to determine the temperature that is not given in the problem, whatever the temperature might be, based on the formula of the N. So the number of transfer units. But if you are given all this, then you can determine the actual number of transfer unit for your particular dryer. If it's not stated, then it's okay to assume that it is 1.5 because as per design, that is the standard number of transfer unit for adiabatic dryers. Now, this is a sample problem that will illustrate the application of the rotary drum dryer, which is oftentimes the most, uh, the oftentimes used drying uh, equipment in the industry, especially in the case of cement and those industries that are producing granular solids in bulk okay so you're given here a flow of 0.35 kilograms per second on a dry basis of a solid to be dried from 15 percent to 0.5 percent moisture also on a dry basis the mean heat capacity of the solid is 2.2 kilojoule per kilogram degree Kelvin and it is proposed that a co-current adiabatic dryer should be used with the solids entering at 300 Kelvin and because of the heat sensitive nature of the solids leaving at 325 Kelvin. Hot air is available at 400 Kelvin with a humidity of 0 0.01 kilogram per kilogram dry air that is kilogram water per kilogram dry air and the maximum allowable mass velocity of air this is the g prime class is 0.95 kilogram per meter squared second now what diameter and length should be specified for the proposed dryer so this is now actually designing your 
rotary dryer. Now the wet bulb temperature of air at 400 Kelvin and for a humidity of 0.01 is 312 Kelvin. If this is not given class, if this is not given, you are to determine it using the psychrometric chart. Now the specific heat of the water vapor is 1.88 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin and that of the solid only is 2.18 kilojoule per kilogram kelvin now it's stated here that you are to assume a number of transfer units equal to 1.5 if this is not stated it's okay to assume because it is standard that your n is equal to 1.5 so let's go now to our board to show to you how is this to be solved so let me just uh, go here so we will start with the given in this problem. So what we're given and based on the given, we'll work our way starting with the formula that we will be using. So we'll have a block for our dryer. And you have feed here. So the value of our feed is 0.35 kilogram per second. And this is dry feed so this is dry solid so I will this is on dry basis rather so I will place an asterisk there it has an initial moisture content of 0.15 dry basis also this means that this is your water over dry solid type of uh, moisture uh, for your feed and the temperature of the feed is 300 Kelvin so this is 300 okay now the CP of the solids here anyway I've read the problem to you the CP of the solids is 2.2 kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin as for the moisture content dry basis as well this is 0 0.005 here at the end and the temperature of the feed here dried feed is 325 kelvin Uh, what else so for our air it's at to TA1 is at 400 Kelvin and here you have the outlet temperature of air and of course I will place here the amount of water vaporized okay now it is mentioned I'd like to place it in here that the air velocity the G is equal to point nine five kilogram 
per square meter per second. And you're given the humidity. You have your humidity here for air. I will just place it in here. There's no space there. Is 0 0.01 kilojoule per kilogram dry air. And aside from that, we have the TA1 which is already 400. So these are your given information for the problem. And the problem requires that you determine the diameter and the length of the dryer. So now we have to start thinking or if you're the one solving this problem, you are to start thinking in what particular part of the discussion will you get the diameter and the length of your dryer. So if you recall in the discussion in the PowerPoint that the length of a rotary dryer is given by the formula Q divided by 0 0.0625 pi d g prime raise it to 0 0.67 and it's to be okay your denominator also consists of the delta t log mean okay meaning i will we will be able to find the length if we know the diameter so the diameter is needed for you to know the length so it's a given that you need to first determine the diameter when you know the diameter, you need to know the total amount of heat transferred, the air mass velocity, and the delta T log mean. That way, you will be able to determine the length of your dryer. So, we started with the formula that we will be using so that we'll find the length of our dryer. Now, this G prime is the air mass flow rate of your air. So, air mass flow rate, the mass flow rate of your air in this case na a way of expressing its velocity now since you already have the formula you now have to decide which of the things that appear in the formula will i need to determine first because there's just one two three four you have the q you have the d you have the g prime and the delta t log mean to determine but i think you will agree with me that the ACS to determine is the delta t log mean in this case because when you speak of the q this q in here you will need to of course account for all the energies of all the streams in your dryer so the first thing that we will do is since we want to know the delta t log mean is we will have to establish the formula for the delta t log mean so we will write here delta t log mean so for adiabatic dryers or rather for rotary dryers not just adiabatic dryers the delta t log mean and you have learned this also in uh, heat transfer is delta t1 minus delta t2 all over the ln of delta t1 over delta t2 i'll be able to solve for this delta t log mean if i have all temperatures given all meaning i need all four temperatures and since if we go back to the illustration the temperatures that we know so far are these three i still do not know this one the ta2 so we need to find the ta2 that way we'll be able to determine the delta t log mean so since for now we cannot solve for it we'll have this as our equation two okay now we will first determine the corresponding wet bulb temperature the wet bulb temperature wet bulb temperature for your uh, air 
that is so we will have for ta1 we have 400 kelvin and it's given that its humidity is 0 0.01 i will not anymore write the units you know the unit for humidity now from your psychrometric chart the wet bulb temperature is equal to 312 Kelvin the wet bulb temperature now knowing the wet bulb temperature will allow you to determine the TA2 because you need the wet bulb temperature in the formula for the N if you recall I've shown to you the formula for N for adiabatic dryers so I will place here N is equal to that formula is actually the LN of inlet temperature of air minus its wet bulb temperature over outlet temperature of air minus its wet bulb temperature so the reason why we determine the wet bulb temperature based on the two conditions stated for our inlet air and that's the 400 kelvin in the humidity is for us to be able to use the formula for the number of units for an adiabatic dryer in order to complete the four temperatures that we need in the delta T lugmin that we will try to find first because it's the easiest as I have mentioned to determine so in this case now it's mentioned in the problem that this one is 1.5 so you will have to equate this to the ln of so your TA1 is 400 your wet bulb temperature is 312 this is the outlet temperature that we're trying to find and you have 312 for the wet bulb temperature again so from the n formula the number of units transfer units that is we're able to find ta2 so ta2 is equal to 331 point so this is 331.5 Kelvin now knowing all four temperatures so here for the Delta T1 minus Delta T2 LN of Delta T1 over Delta T2 we can now solve for Delta T log mean so we will now solve for the delta t lumen so that would be so for the delta t lumen you have the delta t1 and that would be the temperature of the air minus its Sorry, guys. So the delta T log mean that you will use here in the formula for dryers is not the delta T log mean that we have used in the uh, heat exchanger, but rather the temperatures of the air leaving and entering the dryer. Well, from it we will subtract the wet bulb temperature. So this is inlet temperature minus the wet bulb temperature minus outlet temperature minus the wet bulb temperature so take note of this it's the wet bulb temperature that we subtract from the temperatures of the air entering and leaving the dryer but in terms of the formula it's following the formula that we use for the heat exchanger so we have the ln of in this case this would be 88 and we have 
312, so that would be 80, 19.5. So this one, 312 to make it 330, that would be 18, 19.5. Okay? Now, and you will have a delta T log mean of 45.5. Forty-five point five uh, Kelvin. Okay, for delta T log mean. So now we have taken care of the delta T log mean. So we can now go to doing our balances, our heat balances. So we will determine the total amount of heat that is. Uh, to be supplied by your dryer that way the desired percentage of uh, moisture content for your feed as it leaves the that is your dried material as it leaves your rotary dry will be achieved okay so we will have to determine the q the next goal is determine the q total okay now in determining the q total you will determine the amount of uh, shall i say the total amount of heat that is to be supplied by your drying medium in this case air that way it accomplishes the drying uh, objective so we will account for the q so this will be actually the sum of all the q's the q i like this to be q1 labeled as q1 q of the total solids now the q of the total solids if you recall cp delta t formula still will be used and the cp of the solid here is where is there it's 2.2 for the solid and uh, for water, we will use the standard Q, uh, CP for water. Now, the total amount of heat that will be used to dry up the solids will be this. Okay, wait. Okay, Q1 will make this specifically the total heat to be supplied to dry the solids so for the total solids to be dried from 325 to 300 kelvin we'll be using the cp delta t as i have mentioned so 2.2 times so we have 325 for the inlet uh, temperature and 300 for the outlet temperature so we need so this is how it's to be interpreted you need 54 0.5 kilojoule per kilogram heat energy that way your temperature for your shall i say for your feed that contains the the moisture would be decreased to uh 300 so it will have to be decreased to 300 in this case class it has to be let me check in this case our inlet temperature is 300 our uh, final temperature is 325 so this is drying with a corresponding increase in temperature so this not decrease i stand corrected but it's an increase in the temperature so this is the amount of energy needed that way from an initial temperature of 300 your feed will have its final temperature to be at 325 so this is again i will define this is the amount of heat necessary for your total solid feed to be increased to have an increase in temperature of 300 to 325 so that's the first amount of energy amount of heat energy that will be supplied by your air the next would be that for the moisture so q I like to label this Q sub 2 but we'll define this as the amount of energy to raise or to increase I will just abbreviate it to increase the moisture content of your feed because your feed has water on it 
to the dew point. So I will have this as dew. It's so hard to write. I'll capitalize it so you will understand. To dew point. Okay, I will define this so that it, later on when you do your own thing, you will understand the process. So, Q1 is the amount of energy to increase the temperature of the solids because this is the CP of the solid. Q2 is the amount of energy needed to increase the temperature of the moisture present in your feed to the dew point temperature. Now, you may ask why the need to increase the temperature of the moisture content to the dew point it's because it cannot be converted to gas the liquid in your solid cannot be converted into gas unless it reaches the dew point temperature it cannot change phase unless it it reaches the temperature in which it is about to be changed into the gas phase because we know that when we change from liquid to gas it's a constant temperature process but from a certain temperature in order to reach the temperature of the dew point that is we need a certain amount of energy for that so in this case we are quantifying for that particular amount of energy so in this case your uh, moisture content in the field let's see your feed has a 0.15 moisture content. So that would be our starting point here. So the mass is 0.15. And your feed is having, of course, for the water. We, as I've said, we will use the standard CP for water, which is 4.187. And this will be the temperature. So 312 from 300 now the answer here is seven point five kilojoule per kilogram by the way class uh, the 312 that you're seeing here it's not the dew point uh, temperature but rather the wet bulb temperature I will change this to the wet bulb temperature Okay, so now you have 7.5. Then you have the Q2 vaporized. Q3, this is the amount of heat for vaporization. So for a vaporization, you need the latent heat, 2410, two, that's the latent heat time. So you have 0 0.15 minus 0 0.005. You may wondering why, where is this 2? 1410 uh, came from and this too now the 0.15 and the 0 0.005 came from the initial and the final moisture content so this same moisture we need to convert into gas and as such we call that the q for vaporization you want to vaporize that particular this amount of water the difference of the two is the water that was vaporized actually. Now, the question is, where did this particular value of 2,410 came from? So, I will just have it written here. This is the latent heat. 
So notice this class that the temperatures that we're using here based on the steam table will be on the wet bulb temperature, not the dew point temperature. This is the latent heat of vaporization. Latent heat of vaporization and this is at so this is based on the wet bulb temperature of 312 so you are to get this from the steam tables again so this is the amount of heat necessary to vaporize your liquid water in the feed or the or a portion it's not all actually because you, you still have moisture in the dried material a portion of the liquid water in your feed this is the amount of heat needed to vaporize that portion actually the difference of these two so for this one your answer will be let me check. Three hundred forty-nine point five kilojoule per kilogram. Okay, now you have three Qs already, but there's still more. So this actually all pertains to what we have in to the feed, the solid that needs to be increased to a certain temperature the moisture content that needs to uh, be converted to uh, that part of the water which is now ready to vaporize and as such we used here the wet bulb temperature so moisture to wet bulb temperature you need a certain energy for that and once in the wet bulb temperature how much heat is needed to change its phase from liquid to gas and that's for vaporization the next thing that we need to account for, we we'll have this labeled as Q4, is the amount of heat to to increase remaining moisture. remaining moisture to solid outlet temperature remember class that there is still moisture remaining in the feed that only needs to increase its temperature from 300 to 325 so in this case this q4 is equal to this is actually the remaining amount of moisture in the feed that was not vaporized it's now in the dried material so the remaining moisture is the moisture in the dried material this moisture needs to uh, 4.187 so this is amount this is the cp and it needs to increase to 325 because this is the final temperature of your uh, dried material as it leaves the dryer its initial temperature is 300 but notice class that this is not 300 because now this moisture that remained in your dried material is actually moisture that already reached the dew point temperature but was not converted into water vapor so this is that the amount of energy that you need for the remaining moisture in the dried material to increase its temperature from the wet bulb temperature to 325 from the wet bulb temperature to 325 because it's still there it's not it was not accounted for this moisture which is 0 0.005 is not accounted for in here because actually it was subtracted from the initial that way what you will only convert to vapor is the difference between these two and as such you multiply that to the latent heat 
this one is the remaining moisture in the dried material which needs to increase its temperature to 325 so the value of this heat needed to increase the temperature of the remaining moisture from the wet bulb temperature to the 325 final temperature of the dried material is 0 0.3 kilojoule weight class Okay, sorry for that class uh, we have I have a call from the office okay this is kilojoule by the way so we have one more Q to account for so your Q5 let's define what is this Q so this is the amount to to raise the evaporate evaporated moisture the moisture that was evaporated to air outlet temperature I will summarize everything I will just uh, it, uh, place here the formula so that you will know later on when you do your own accounting for the energies present and total energy requirement you would know now this would be if you notice we will again subtract the initial moist the final moisture rather from the initial this represents the evaporated moisture However, this evaporated moisture only reach actually only reach the temperature which is 325 but it did not yet reach the outlet temperature of the air in which it's going to go with. Remember as I have explained to you, your evaporated water although written in the schematic diagram of your dryer is a separate uh, shall I say arrow or stream but rather it is to be viewed that it goes with the air that was used as the heating medium so it cannot leave your dryer based on the outlet temperature only of the dried material but rather it should leave your dryer based on the outlet temperature of the air in which it is going to go with so in this case this is the moisture that was evaporated the difference of the initial and the final of course we need to multiply it with the CP of water vapor i gave it to you then that would be the same cp of water vapor that we're going to use in here so if you haven't memorized this one the cp of water vapor is 1.88 kilojoule per kilogram and as i've said the final temperature of your dried material is only 325 and your water vapor is to increase its temperature beyond the 325 it's going to increase it to uh, 331.5 and that is the temperature of the air in which it's going to go with so your answer here will be 5.3 kilojoule per kilogram okay now if you will take all the sums so your Q total will be the sum of all five Q's. There's really something wrong with my pen. I don't know. Pasensya na class. So this is it. Now if you're going to add all Q's that would amount to 417.1 kilojoule per kilogram and what is this per kilogram this is per kilogram of the feed if you recall plus I, actually you might be wondering why is it that there's no feed multiplier here because all of this came from the feed because you want to multiply it here already 
So, we want to multiply the 417 here on the next slide. A Q total of 417.1 kilojoule per kilogram feed. So, you will multiply it with the feed in this case, which is uh, how much is our feed? Point 35 kilograms per second. So, then you get rid of the kilogram here and you have a total Q of 146 kilowatt. Okay. Let me explain because the very heart of solving this problem is really doing the right accounting for the total energy that your air is going to supply to your uh, feed that has to be reduced in terms of its uh, moisture content. Okay, The Q total will consist of number one, the Q that is needed to increase the temperature of the solid only of the feed from, two, from 300 to 325. So this is the formula and this will be your answer. Now, next is the Q that is needed to increase the water or that's the moisture in your feed to the wet bulb temperature. I mentioned it's the dew point temperature. I stand corrected. That should be the wet bulb temperature. So, 15% of your feed is water or moisture. So, that's 0.15 times the CP of water times the temperature 312 minus 300. By the way, class, this is not 350. That's 300, okay? Now, you have increased the temperature of the water in your feed to the wet bulb temperature, which is 312. Now, that particular amount of water that you need to vaporize, the water that is to be removed, that way your feed is reduced to a percentage moisture of 0 0.005 in the dried material is represented by this formula. The latent heat of water here is based also on the wet bulb temperature and you have here the difference of the moisture content of your feed. Actually, all of this will have F, this will have F, and this will have F, which we only multiply to the last Q, the summed up Q. So, this is the amount of heat needed to vaporize the portion of the water in the feed, not all, because we still have moisture in the dried material. The fourth Q is the amount of heat needed to increase the remaining moisture in the feed to the outlet temperature of the dried material because that remaining moisture class only reached until the dew point temperature. It has not reached 325 which is the final temperature of the dried material. So what we do that 0 0.005 times F again times 4.187 times this is the cp by the way of water times this change in temperature or difference rather in temperature so this is your q your fifth q is the amount of heat necessary to raise the evaporated moisture to air outlet temperature so i have mentioned already a while ago that your moisture that is evaporated only reached up to the wet bulb temperature it it did not even go beyond yet the uh, exit temperature of the dried material. But the goal here is not that it will not only reach the final temperature of the dried material, but it should reach the final temperature of the air because it's going to uh, go with the air. So that particular formula is this. 0.15 minus 0 0.005, the evaporated moisture in the feed, times the CP of water vapor, times 331.5 and this is the final temperature of the air in which this water is to go with minus 312 so the answer is 5.3 since all of this has f you need to take the sum of all the q and that sum would be 417.1 now that 417.1 need to be multiplied by your feed which is 0.35 to get the total amount of Q for your feed. Okay? Feed that was uh, 
shall I say, increased in temperature to the dried material outlet temperature and to a portion of the water which was uh, evaporated and who has to reach its temperature to the outlet temperature of the air. Now, since we're done already determining the total amount of heat, the next thing that we should do, class, is determining the amount of, or that's the mass flow rate of the air. That's the G, the mass flow rate of the air. Now, for us to be able to get the mass flow rate of the air, now we will use still as a guide the Q equal to MCP delta T from your thermodynamics. So, I will place here M cp delta t but this time we will apply this generic formula of mcp delta t to our problem which concerns the air already so your m will be the g that would be let's say that's the g1 the total mass that is of the air times its cp will be the we call that actually class the cp to be the humid heat that the humid heat of our air mixture the dry air from the uh, the dry air plus the moisture content okay now this G1 the total that is will be multiplied to 1 plus Y1 why is it 1 plus Y1? Remember, the humidity class in here is dry air plus the uh, water over dry air. So, we need to add to it the 1 for our formula. This will now account for the total amount of heat uh, that will be supplied for our total amount of air that is. So, this is for the total M, this one. The G1, 1 plus Y1 is for the M. For the CP, that was what I mentioned, that you now need to determine the humid heat of the air. Now, I'd like to label this as CP1 and I'll have it here as humid heat. We will determine later separately the humid heat before we can determine the G1 from this formula. Then we have, of course, the T1 minus the T2. For the delta t so again the m in this formula is your g1 times the quantity 1 plus y1 where y1 is the uh in representation in our representation actually this y1 is the humidity of our air that enters so h1 times cp1 the humid heat of the air and water vapor mixture and this one is the change in the temperature now since we still do not know the humid heat i will label this as equation three i think this is equation three okay that's equation three so we will have that then we will determine first the cp1 or that's the humid heat for our uh, dry air and water vapor mixture now the formula class for the spe for the specific heat but specifically in drying problem we refer to that as the humid heat of the air water vapor mixture the formula class is this it's a standard formula that we use it's 1 plus 1 1.9 times the humidity so in this case if we will substitute the humidity so this is 1.9 times point uh, what's our humidity so our humidity is point zero one you will have an answer here of one point zero three one point zero three kilojoule per kilogram Kelvin and now you're ready to go back to the formula that we have from equation 3 so from 3 so we will use the value that we got for the total Q that's 146 so this is times 10 anyway this is a uh, 
already in kilojoule our cp is in kilojoule so there's no need for us to convert the kilowatt to watt so 146 then this is to be equated to the g sub 1 which is the mass flow rate of the air now entering the dryer then we have 1 plus 0 0.01 then we have the humid heat we will just determine which we just determined 1.03 and we have the temperature so for the air our initial temperature is 400 so this is a given class that this one will be negative the amount of heat that is liberated by the air is the same amount of heat that your feed received and that's 146 we cannot place here the actual final minus initial temperature here because this side will become negative so we will just make it positive so 400 minus the final temperature which is 331.5 i think you know what i mean so this amount of energy was liberated by air so this should be negative we just place the quant the magnitude here because we, we are equating it to a positive value so in this case now you will be getting a g1 the mass flow rate of air which is 2.07 kilogram per second so that's kilogram per second now this g1 is the total air meaning the dry air plus the moisture that it contains now we only want the dry air and that is the g and that's the g or the g prime in the case in our problem on the formula that you saw in the uh, powerpoint slide i like to check whether i wrote it here as g prime so it's g prime this one refers to the dry air only not the total air and moisture that it contains and remember that when you did the q equation here with the g the mass of dry air that would be total mass of uh, air also dry air and water vapor that it contains so in this case the g prime would be equal to all you have to do is divide the 2.07 kilogram per second by the total amount of air and water vapor and the total amount is 1.01 .01 kilogram per kilogram dry air now you may wonder where did you get the 1.01 .01? miss remember the humidity of your air is 0 0.01 kilogram water per kilogram dry air so if you get the sum of the total that would be one kilogram uh dry air plus 0 0.01 kilogram water so that would make it 1.01 .01. so in this case you'll be getting now if you divide this total mass flow rate of air and water vapor by 1.01 .01, you'll be getting a value of 2.05 kilogram per second so now you have determined the uh, g and that's the g for your formula here so let's check in our formula what we already know so far that way we can determine what it is that we still don't lack so based on our formula we have this the q total we have this already and we have this what remains is the d i need to find the d so i can find the l so we will do that We get to find the area the diameter is solved using the area we need to have the mass flow rate it's so this take time because i cannot write properly the mass flow rate of air and this is the g and we will divide it by the maximum velocity we 
the mass flow rate air of air is the total that would be the 2.07 it's not just the dry air but the total divided by the maximum velocity of the air which is given in the problem uh, i think it's here this one the g the maximum velocity of air allowed allowable maximum velocity of the air so that's 0 0.95 kilogram per square meter per second so actually it's this dimensional analysis because the remaining unit will be meter squared so this is kilograms per second we divide it by 0 0.95 and this one is kilogram per square meter per second so this gives you a value of uh, 2.18 oh my it's 2.18 square meter now if you want the diameter that would be 2.18 you equate this to pi d squared all over 4 and this will point out to you the d so the d in this case will be 1.67 meters okay 1.67 meters then we have everything already the diameter So the diameter here, this one. So everything, you just substitute in here all the given and you will be getting the, the L. So from 1, I leave the substitution to you anyway you will just need to substitute the uh, the q the d the g prime and the delta t log mean and you'll be getting a value for the l which is 10.1 meters so this is how long this problem is so you have the length and the diameter of the dryer here if you would be asked uh, let me check um, what diameter and length should be specified for the proposed dryer okay so that's it class so this is the this is our answer for the problem requiring for the length and the diameter of the dryer okay the maximum velocity of the air was given in the problem it's stated in the problem i suggest that when you listen to the discussion here you have in uh, in another uh, piece of paper or in your laptop or in your cell phone the written problem that way you can follow through the values that i have been using so this will be the end of the topic for drying. This is also the end for all the topics that we have discussed for this semester under heat and mass transfer.